After a failed attempt by Megatron to retrieve leadership, Buster is sent back into town with some college students for safety, while Ratchet tries to figure out his next move. Shockwave uses Soundwave to secure one of Blackrock's jet manufacturing plants, while Blackrock himself works to help Josie out, whose nervous system has been fried by the electrocution. Still, she's able to move one hand and is making plans for them. Ratchet sneaks into the Ark and, after a pep talk from Optimus's head, gets into a fight with Megatron. He's clearly outgunned, but upon learning Learning that Shockwave is now in command, he makes an offer to join forces with Megatron to take him down. Well, actually, it says, help you defend Shockwave, but I can assume that was just a typo. Otherwise, Ratchet's kind of a moron for thinking that would entice Megatron. And no, that was not corrected for the IDW reprint. Oh, and Megatron now explains why Shockwave didn't just leave right away. Passing through the radiation belt around Earth adversely affected his guidance systems, and before he could reorient himself to find the Ark, he was attacked by the Dinobots. Which, yeah, I appreciate getting answers to my questions a few issues later, but now the timescale really seems off, since how the hell were the Dinobots built so damn quickly before Shockwave could restore himself? Anyway, while Megatron is dubious that Ratchet could successfully defeat Shockwave, he does agree to Ratchet's demand that, if they're successful, he'll hand the Ark and the Autobots back over to him, even doing some super serious Cybertronian bonding ritual to prove his sincerity. Of course, these are the dudes with deception in their name, so naturally Megatron has no intention of honoring that agreement. Issue 8 sees Ratchet travel to the Savage Land and finds the Dinobots, scanning through their memories to find out how they defeated Shockwave. Short answer, rocks fall, everybody dies. While he revives the Dinobots, Shockwave moves Optimus's head to the manufacturing plant so he can create six new Decepticons to aid in his efforts. Josie watches all this on TV and finalizes the first part of a new enhancement, equipping cybernetic implants to her hand that allow her freedom of movement. Yes, if you're familiar with the episode I did last Christmas, this is the birth of Circuit Breaker, who will become a recurring foe throughout this book. Ratchet meets up with Megatron, who of course plans to betray him, but fortunately Ratchet anticipated that and has the Dinobots fight him. Still, Megatron's no slouch in combat, and it's only good fortune that the cliff he was on collapses and he falls down a mountain that Ratchet wins. Megatron turns into gun mode so as to save himself, though he's buried in snow and rocks. Megatron was the only one guarding the Ark, all the other Decepticons having either moved into the captured oil platform or the manufacturing plant. So Ratchet is quickly able to retake it and restore the Autobots to normal. While the Decepticons left behind some additional fuel reserves that recharge them, sadly they're in no shape to mount a rescue, as Ratchet points out. It's a bad sign for your chain of command, or just how badly they've been beaten down, that next in command status now falls to the medical officer. Needing more fuel and learning about Blackrock developing some kind of anti-robot weapon, Jazz and Wheeljack are sent to talk to Blackrock and explain the situation with the two factions, maybe make a deal with him for fuel. Speaking of, Josie reveals herself as Circuit Breaker to Blackrock, and as with the Christmas issue, I do wonder why she never bothered to figure out how to incorporate pants or even boots into all this. The suit also grants her the ability to remotely access computer files and blast electronic devices. She's also developed an electromagnetic field that allows her to fly. Seeing this impressive display, flight, restoration of full body paralysis, remote hacking tech, and all Blackrock can say is, Josie, go back to bed. Blackrock is genuinely a decent person who doesn't want Josie to get hurt again. But he's also kind of painfully stupid at times. So let's talk about Circuit Breaker for a second here, because like Spider-Man, she's a victim of the copyrighted characters problem. This isn't like ROM, where the rights are more complicated, wherein Marvel pretty much owns everything around ROM, but not ROM himself. No, this is what would normally be a thing with a licensed comic. Anything created in this comic belongs to Hasbro, because it's done in the licensed book. Problem is that Bob Budiansky decided that he wanted Circuit Breaker to be a Marvel-owned character, so he arranged for Circuit Breaker to first appear in the event comic Secret Wars 2. Amusingly enough, though, even though they are technically the same person, rights issues are stupid, so while Marvel owns the trademark to the Circuit Breaker character, they don't own one for Josie Beller, so Hasbro still owns her. This led to another copyright issue for these IDW reprint books. This series had been reprinted before via Titan Books for a small fee because Marvel didn't think anybody gave a crap about a stupid old toy tie-in comic. And upon discovering that, yeah, people actually give a crap about this stuff, 
up the fee to ridiculous amounts when IDW decided to reprint the books. So Circuit Breaker's appearances, like Spider-Man's, had to be replaced with summaries of what happened. Except for the final volume of the book, where her presence is integral to major plot points, so they had to do it. And it's not like Marvel had any grand plans for her or have used her for anything since then. They're squatting on the license just to be greedy. Anyway, Josie's obsessed with revenge and all, but instead of trying to placate her a little bit, saying, yes, we can use this tech to gain your revenge, but it also has limitless other possibilities, and you should still spend more time testing and recovering before we try to send you into battle, Blackrock's just, nah, you'll get hurt. What's especially amusing is that he is a capitalist. The army actually stopped by to ask him not to unveil a new anti-robot cannon he's developing because they still suspect a foreign power is behind the Transformers and they want to deal with this as a national security matter, but BlackRock was only concerned with his shareholders getting pissed about him looking like he's not doing anything to fight them. Jazz makes contact with him and he agrees to their deal, but at the unveiling of the anti-robot cannon, Circuit Breaker disrupts its electronics so it won't work. As someone one who hates robots, I am infuriated that BlackRock built this anti-robot cannon! Yeah, yeah, she wants to be his secret weapon to fight them, but still, seems like a dumb move on her part. The Decepticons attack and Jazz tries to help, but despite Blackrock's pleas, Circuit Breaker sees all the Transformers as equally bad. After the Decepticons retreat, he does finally get her to stop attacking Jazz and Wheeljack, but only out of respect to Blackrock for his want to make up for what happened to her. She makes it clear that next time she encounters them, she won't hesitate to kill them all. Well, unless it's Christmas. Optimus zapping Buster was actually him implanting the creation matrix into his body, which he's been using unintentionally to have telekinetic abilities and minor psychic powers. However, before the matrix was transferred, Shockwave used it to instill life into six brain modules. And with the manufacturing plant in his control, Shockwave in issue 10 has created the Constructicons, aka the first combiner team, all six joining together to form their own Megazord named Devastator. Oh, and once again, as a reminder, Reminder that just because Blackrock is a good guy doesn't mean he isn't also, well, a bit of a douchebag rich guy, he informs the Autobots that he bugged the phones at the plant. I devised the system to improve security there. Make sure no one was saying anything they shouldn't. You know, things like, we should unionize, or for the love of God, can I go to the bathroom? The Decepticons are able to briefly transmit a message to Cybertron about their situation, and in issue 11, find out that Buster has the creation matrix within him. Shockwave wants to use it for a new Transformer, Jetfire, which currently is assembled, but it has no brain, so it just obeys simple commands. As such, he dispenses Jetfire out to grab Buster, but the lack of a mind means that Buster can disassemble it at will with the power of the creation matrix. Which he does so. He then reassembles it, and, with Bumblebee's help, reprograms Jetfire to obey him. In issue 12, Buster is inadvertently knocked out and brought back to the plant, where Shockwave hooks him up to a machine to utilize the creation matrix. Fortunately, since he still has control over Jetfire, he uses it to take Optimus' head back to the Autobots, restoring their beloved leader. I would just like to note that for about seven or eight issues, more than half a year's worth of stories, and more than half of this book's existence up to this point, Optimus has only been a head and a prisoner of the bad guys. Shockwave is dumped into a swamp and Optimus doesn't kill him despite having the chance because he wants to go and help Buster. And he doesn't order the other Autobots to do it because... Well, again, he's only been a head for a while now. Dude's still getting his footing. Buster transfers the Creation Matrix back into Optimus. Meanwhile, issue 13 brings us a done-in-one, sorta filler issue, where a criminal finds Megatron in gun mode. His higher brain functions were damaged from the fall on the snow and rocks, so he does whatever he's ordered to do. Something the criminal takes advantage of to try to improve his life, only to find that being a crime boss isn't really all it's cracked up to be. Tossing Megatron aside apparently is all it takes to fix his brain. The dude stands up for himself to Megatron when he threatens to kill him, which amuses him that somebody could be so brave. It is deserving of Megatron's respect, not his wrath. Unfortunately, while Megatron can now think properly again, Megatron can only speak in the third person now.
Issue 14 begins with Jetfire given a full mind, wherein he officially joins the Autobots. A lot of them have been severely damaged from the recent fight, Ratchet saying that they lack a lot of spare parts necessary to repair them, although that might be because the Ark, once again, builds new Transformers! Well, sort of. The bodies are new, but the minds are not. Copies of Warriors Optimus knew back on Cybertron. This is what happens when your ship has a Promote New Toys subroutine in it. BlackRock and the Navy set up a blockade around the stolen oil rig to try to contain the Decepticons, who are having issues with leadership after Shockwave was dropped into the swamp. Shockwave has abandoned us! We've been here for weeks awaiting his next order! If he won't command the Decepticons, then I will! Honestly, it's just kind of surprising that it's taken weeks for Starscream to finally declare himself the new leader. I would have expected that within an hour of not hearing anything from Shockwave. Shockwave soon returns, and he's been busy, having developed the energy converter that Sparkplug was supposed to build. The device is relatively portable, so they don't need to be stationed out of the oil rig anymore. They can use it to draw out energy from any fuel source and convert it to energon cubes for their use. They head off to steal energy from a nearby concert being done by Brick Springhorn and the 10th Avenue Band. Eh, I was never into them. I much preferred Doctrine Dirty Water Resurrection. The Decepticons were even able to harness the energy of sound into cubes, but fortunately our heroes routed them, even destroyed the energy converter. This brings us to issue 15. As I mentioned earlier, the army asked BlackRock not to talk about the anti-robot weapon. The government is worried about the panic that would erupt if they knew that giant robots were waging a war all around them and had no way of stopping them. The fictional Intelligence and Information Institute, or 3i, is summoned to try to work out a way to suppress public knowledge about them. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. BlackRock is also brought in, and he starts to explain the whole Autobots and Decepticons thing, but they're not interested in hearing about distinguishing between the two sides, or hearing what else he has to say about the forces they have been trying to figure out! An intelligence organization that fears intelligence historically not awesome. Getting inspiration from a Robot Master comic book that his son has, one of the agents of 3i hires the writer of that comic to come up with a plausible backstory to the Transformers that they can feed to the public. I know they're just being meta here, but really all I'm thinking is, man, the movie Wag the Dog was great, but what if the fake story they had in that involved giant robots? The writer comes up with a human villain, Robot Master, who claims to be behind the robot attacks. He's played by the comic writer himself in order to reduce the amount of people who are in on the scheme. And now I just wish that the writer they had gotten was Alan Moore. Would have made the dude a wizard too. Unfortunately, the Decepticons, while at first pissed about all this, decide to take advantage of this to help turn humanity against the Autobots. Megatron rejoins forces with Soundwave during this, making his own plans to finally retake his forces from Shockwave. Issue 16 is a standalone story mostly for Bumblebee's character development. The conflict of him not being sure if he belongs with the Autobots or not kind of comes out of nowhere and it gets fairly easily resolved, so we'll move on to issue 17, where the action cuts back to Cybertron. The Decepticons have taken over most of the planet, and it's a hellhole now. A severe lack of resources and a lot of the regular population of Cybertronians are in disrepair and lacking energy. Just to add to the dark prospects of this world, there's a massive smelting pool that the Decepticons use to melt down Cybertronians to use for raw materials. There's an Autobot resistance led by the microscope I mentioned at the start, Perceptor, though the rest of the group tends to have more respect for Blaster, Soundwave's Autobot counterpart, who turns into a whole stereo as opposed to just the cassette player. Which you'd think I'd be all over given my love of Soundwave, but I don't know. Blaster's fine, but there's something about Soundwave that just makes him infinitely cooler. Maybe it's the voice. Issue 17's a great tragic story about an Autobot who dies retrieving a copy of the signal the Decepticons got. The message from Earth informing their homeworld of their circumstances. Issue 18 sees the Cybertronian Decepticons working on developing the Space Bridge, a way to instantaneously transport their forces between the two planets. In the TV show, the Space Bridge was essentially a big teleporter. In the comic, it's literally a bridge. One half of it on Cybertron, the other on Earth that you pass through an archway to end up on the other side. Shockwave and Megatron receive a return signal from Cybertron and inform them of the Space Bridge, so they put 
put aside their rivalry for the time being in order to secure their reinforcements. The Autobot Resistance manages to disable the bridge and accidentally cross over to Earth. We enter issue 19 with the Autobots having finished construction of Omega Supreme, an even bigger robot that can defend the Ark while they launch an attack on the Decepticons to try to gain information about Devastator and the Combiner's process. Unfortunately, the Dinobots are annoyed by Prime. Since he doesn't want to piss off the humans, they try to minimize open warfare with the Decepticons, and even when they launch an assault like this, Prime doesn't want to do anything more than retrieve information to avoid Autobot casualties. As such, the Dinobots leave, thinking their role of being warriors is wasted. Me, Grimlock, want to fight Decepticons! Why you leave to go fight Decepticons when me could be fighting Decepticons? They're successful in their mission, Omega Supreme even downing six Decepticons that launched a vain attempt at taking the Ark. In the meantime, Robot Master, aka Donnie Finkelberg, has escaped from the Decepticons and hopes to warn our heroes about the Space Bridge. In issue 20, the only Autobot casualty of the attack, Skids, gets picked up by a woman who is an Old West enthusiast who wants to make him into her new car. Skids eventually reveals himself to her and wants to stay out of the war. He's an anthropologist, not a soldier, and is happy to just keep being her car if it means studying humanity. Studying humanity apparently includes getting washed by her in a tight t-shirt and cutoffs. So I guess Michael Bay did adapt some things accurately. Skids eventually learns that he has to play his part in the war, though admittedly it kind of comes across as douchey. Like it or not, each of us has a role in life. We can't deny it. We can only try to make the best of it. You are a cashier. I... I'm an Autobot warrior. Sorry, Charlene, but to think you could be anything else but a cashier means you're living in a dream world. Best to just settle for what you got, loser. Issue 21 reveals that the Decepticons have finished repairs on the Space Bridge, so they start working on getting fuel resources again to send back to Cybertron, taking control of Hoover Dam and siphoning power from it. With their information on the Combiner technology, our heroes have constructed their own, the Aerialbots, who quickly arrive to save the dam, forming into Superion. Meanwhile, Finkelberg makes contact with the Autobots and informs them of what's been going on, including of the Autobots from Cybertron who arrived. Unfortunately, we learn at the end of the issue that the four were already captured by RAT, the government's new task force, short for Rapid Anti-Robot Assault Team. Which really means that their name should be RARAT, but why would we ever want to break away from such a great acronym as RAT? And their leader, who has decapitated them all, Circuit Breaker. Issue 22 begins with a breakdown of what happened exactly, and it seems that the guy who hired Finkelberg for 3i is starting to wonder if maybe Blackrock was correct, seeing as the Autobots weren't being aggressive when they encountered them and... Well, Circuit Breaker's kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Through shenanigans, mostly from the Decepticons managing to plant a bug inside of Optimus's head, they're able to duplicate the creation matrix when Optimus uses it to refine the programming of the aerial bots to give life to another combiner team, the Stunticons. This is what I mean when I say that the book loves to introduce new characters all the time. I really do wonder how much of this is Hasbro coming down and saying, hey, promote this new toy this month, or just the creators wanting to play around with new groups of characters while sidelining old ones. Donnie, frightened by all the combat and action, plus Optimus holding his wallet with a $25,000 check from 3i hostage for his cooperation, turns in skids for a mission they were on to investigate the missing Autobots. He, like the aerial bots in the Seven from Cybertron, is captured by Rat. However, in issue 23, even he's having doubts about all this as Circuit Breaker is deconstructing the captured Autobots and somewhat torturing them in the process. Nice of her to label the different Autobots on their slabs, though. In the meantime, Mega Megatron wants to challenge Optimus Prime to a battle to the death, and thus brings in two new toys to promote, Runabout and Runamuck, to find some way of dramatically making the challenge, as opposed to Soundwave just, you know, calling the Ark like he suggests. The two get inspired by a kid doing the most heinous of activities, Graffiti! You monster! Did you learn nothing from the Tandy Computer Whiz Kids? I mean, what would even compel you to say something as vile and disgusting as... Uh... Vacations are the pits. Huh. Another example of the ongoing struggle of graffiti, fun, or dumb. This leans on the dumb. 
So, yeah, they follow this family as they go on their vacation across the country and write Cybertronian graffiti all over America meaning no one can understand what the hell it is they're writing. Fortunately, we've contacted some other aliens to translate. It just says, Dear Frieza, and it's a picture of a butt. After figuring out where they'll hit next, Circuit Breaker and Rat intercept the two, but when Circuit Breaker forgets to clear the area of civilians before engaging them, she's temporarily relieved of command. Admittedly, Circuit Breaker didn't intend to put civilians in harm's way, and actually gets injured saving a little kid, but clearly her judgment is in question. Finkelberg, wanting out of this whole thing, especially because of his guilt, suggests that instead of relying on the resources of Rat to deal with the two Decepticons, she make a deal with the Autobot bodies she's got lying around. They're in too many pieces to repair in the short time they have, but her ability to interface with electronics gives her the ability to control their bodies, which they jury-rig into some kind of weird gestalt robot. The final target, the Statue of Liberty, gets graffitied in English this time. Humans are wimps! My god, Decepticons, at long last have you no sense of decency! Circuit Breaker is able to destroy them, but the Autobots couldn't be fully controlled by her. She needed to actually make a deal for their cooperation. Said deal being that she let them go once they had completed the mission. However, releasing the Autobots was a step too far from the guy from 3i, so the two are fired from Rat. Circuit Breaker is pissed that the deal has cost her this much, and really goes to show how short their thinking is, since they could still keep her around as an asset even if she isn't in charge. But Finkelberg is just happy to be going home. However, upon hearing that renovations to the Statue of Liberty over the graffiti will cost up to $60,000, he decides to donate his entire paycheck from Rat as restitution for his part in all this. Dude, this part wasn't in any way your fault, and they'll fix the statue regardless, trust me. Just keep the money or use it to buy housing for the homeless or something. Oh, and never mind about that whole wanting to fight in single combat plot point for Megatron. I guess he got bored and decided not to do it. Unfortunately, that brings us to issue 24. I've actually done a review of this before as a live show a couple of times. Because this issue is kind of infamous. It's the one where Optimus Prime elects to commit suicide over winning a video game. Yeah. And the most baffling part is, this is actually a kind of integral story issue. To summarize, because honestly at some point I should just convert the live show into a proper episode, this is on the level of the car wash of doom of infamous stories, which, yeah, we'll be skimming that one again because it falls under today's purview. The Decepticons attack an experimental new power plant to steal energy, but the Autobots arrive to stop them, having found the bug planted in Optimus and reversed the signal to monitor them instead. Because their fight would destroy the plant itself, the sole remaining worker in the plant, a video game enthusiast, suggests plugging all their brains into a video game and duking it out virtually, with victory achieved by destroying the leader of their opposing side. What's more, whoever loses will get destroyed. And yet this is still Still, the best version of any of those movies that go, you die in the game, you die for realsies. While Optimus is victorious, he had to kill some of the NPCs in the game to win. He sees this as a violation of his principles, since if this was the real world, killing innocents to win his war would be just as shameful, and thus he is the true loser. This is utter bullcrap! While I get Optimus's point, the nature of this particular battle is that it isn't real people, that these NPCs are not alive in even the most rudimentary sense. You're allowed to cut loose and do things you couldn't normally do so as to not cause real harm. Otherwise, this gives the unintentional message, oh, you kill people in a video game but not in real life? You might as well be a murderer! And that would be especially awkward for me given how my Hitman streams ended. Stop running the infection! Stop running the infection! I was gonna say, he, like, when he's, uh, like, when he's being nonsense, it sounds like he's basically the Swedish chef. Yeah. Hurry, hurry, hurry. What's more, even if I did agree with Optimus's position on this, he still fulfilled the parameters of the game and defeated the enemy leader so Megatron should still get fried too and the Decepticons should walk away with nothing. But no, Optimus insists that he die and the Decepticons truly won. Optimus 
gets blowed up. Remember how many little kids got traumatized by Transformers the movie? This comic was released a month after the film, and this seems like it'd be even worse if kids read this, because now you've got little kids going, can't play video games anymore, they're what killed Optimus Prime! Buddy Ansky said later that he was just trying to illustrate Optimus's high moral standards, but recognizes that he took it to an absurd extreme. He always intended to bring him back, which is more than the attentions of the movie, but still. Just to add another layer of insanity to this whole thing, the guy who insisted on all this, Ethan Zachary, he made a backup of Optimus's brain and has stored it on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk! I'd like to note that, at best, a five and a quarter inch floppy disk has a maximum storage capacity of 1.2 megabytes! And honestly, you can kind of believe that Optimus's brain is that size given this story. Remember what I said at the beginning of all this? One third of a low resolution copy of a Sailor Moon episode took up more hard drive space than Optimus Prime's brain. And hell, bear in mind that Optimus isn't even the average Transformer. He's got the creation matrix in him too. Oh yeah, and thanks Optimus, you've doomed your race to slow extinction because that's gone now too. God, are we sure that when they found the bug in his brain from before, they didn't actually cause some brain damage? Ugh. So in between issues, they actually had a crossover miniseries between G.I. Joe and Transformers. Not the last that they'd ever have, of course, where the Decepticons team up with Cobra. In issue 25, it gets a mention, but the only actually relevant thing to come out of that is that Bumblebee got destroyed and rebuilt into Goldbug, as he did at the end of season 3 of the cartoon. Beyond that, it can be completely ignored, so we're doing just that. The army has decided to launch a full-scale attack on the Decepticons' base in a coal mine pit. Megatron, however, is distracted. He didn't get satisfaction from Optimus's destruction, and in fact is beginning to wonder if he's dead at all, because he didn't squeeze the life out of him like he does to a Combaticon. Shockwave, realizing that Megatron's emotional instability right now can be taken advantage of, plants the idea in his head that his death was a simulation just like the video game itself. And thus Megs goes insane and starts shooting everything in anger now that he believes Optimus is alive. And to be fair, he is, but you try telling Megatron, crush this flimsy plastic square and your enemy is gone forever. The power plant system they stole was for collecting energy from different thermal layers in the ocean, so the Decepticons quickly vacate the pit in Wyoming to relocate to Florida and gain access to the ocean. Seems like they should actually be headed to the Pacific since it's closer, but what the hell do I know? Linkara versus geography is a recurring thing on this show. Shockwave sends a secret message to another combiner team on Cybertron, the Predacons, with instructions to hunt down and kill Megatron covertly, even having them adopt Autobot symbols to seem like a sneak attack from them. They do a good job, too, ripping off half his face, but he's able to overcome them. He learns that Shockwave sent them to kill him, even made a copy of his personality engrams to aid them in the fight, but realizing that that could be how Optimus survived, he goes completely mad, blasting the space bridge and seemingly destroying himself in the process, allowing Shockwave to once again take command. Issues like this really kind of explain why Galvatron was so completely bonkers. It didn't spring from nowhere. 